Here we go. Hello, everyone. Wow. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Oh. There we go. It's interesting for me to be talking about design in the developer attic because the uh, design is a core part of the development and we should be talking more about it and we don't talk enough about it. So a little bit about myself. I studied architecture back in Brazil. Um, I considered doing computer science but, or design, but I did something in between. And I somehow transitioned to be a developer, uh, working with game-like technology. Blender was my debut professionally as a software developer. I liked it big time. Nowadays, I work here in Amsterdam as part of the Blender team. And I've been doing more design and product management. But let's start with the basics. What is design? There are so many different definitions. And some people see design as UI, UI UX. Now there is design thinking, product thinking. So I go by a definition from Tom, Tom Rosendahl, or everyone knows Tom, I believe. And design is something that exists in between UI, UX, and engineering. Something that's trying to balance both inputs. It's trying to find a big picture, big metaphors that work works on the implementation level, but also in the user-facing level. Bless you. For example, when we were doing uh, view layers and collections back in 2.80, so 2016, we were trying to find diff different ways for users to basically to work and interface with their, their, their um, let's say, their data within the scene. So we already had this metaphor within Blender of a database that's why we have all the objects in Blender, all the data blocks. But we wanted to present a different way to slice, to splice that data in a way to be nicely visualized. So, okay, what is a collection? Maybe you can show that as a folder, as a little bit you can have a different view layers that is a, just a different way to visualize the same data. But a design doesn't need to be something that visually uh, from its conception or even that technical. So you can see here we are leveraging that we have a lot of technical input when you're thinking about all the implications of those solutions. But a design can be as simple as an answer to a question. So we'll hear from the audience, who knows what is an asset? Think about within Blender, can you define what is an asset? Yeah, you're eating, poor guy. <laughs> Okay. An asset is something that you created that you can use in multiple ways. Well, we tried a more minimalistic approach. Asset is a data block with meaning. Okay, so if what are the implications of this? If it's a data block, you don't create an asset. You created a data block already, and you just add extra meaning to it. Okay, how do we communicate that? What does it mean? So here, we're trying to use the same visual language we had already established for layers and view, uh, collections. And okay, if you have the main database, you select a few data blocks and you want them to be asset. That's why in Blender, you mark something as an asset. You don't necessarily create an asset. Um, the so-called metadata or the meaning is what you developers would call as metadata. So the, I mean, the license, catalog, author, the thumbnail, and so on and on. And those simple like one-liners have a lot of implications. One of the long feature requests people have is, hey, I want to save these as an asset. Why can't I go and save as an asset? Well, because it has to be a data block. So maybe you could export as an asset, but save it as it doesn't give you all the answers because do you want to have all the dependent data linked to that or appended? How do you do that? So say, you know what, let's keep it simple. Let users be able to handle all their database and what they want to share and link, they do it locally. And then Blader just leverage these as we do for data blocks. The other implication of this is that anything that you want to be an asset, oh, then it has to be a data block. So for example, Pose Library, which was the, I think was the first data block we got to support the new asset system, wasn't a data block in the beginning. So we say, so in order to support this, let's make an action data block when you save a pose as a pose library. And if users want, they can have one single continuous action with a bunch of keyframes. Those are the pose libraries. Or you can even just have uh, individual ones. So there are a lot of, a lot of implications to those one-liners, but we try to carry them further and further 
within all the entire development process. Another example, who wants to guess what is what are geometry nodes? Habib. <laughs> Do you want to try? Get it wrong, it's fine. Nodes that help you create mesh for geometry. It's also right, the same way it does it. Everything is right. But we try to say, what, what if we just treat geometry node as a modifier? A modifier that can handle complex behavior, but that can just leverage being in the modifier stack and do everything another modifier can do. Okay, but what is a modifier? <laughs> Modifiers, for the non-technical users, they are just black boxes with some inputs and outputs. Okay, that means we want to be able then to have a jump to node as well uh, abstracted, where all the low level complexity is hidden away from the users, and you just have to deal with this high level interface. And that means for Blender, we want to make sure the first citizen of the design is people make sure that all external dependency is listed as an input. And people that really want to violate this design and have some hard-coded values, yeah, we do it after the fact. But we try to have this concept over and over and over reiterated with the implementation. This is older, less people might be aware of this because it is pre-2.80 as well. So for 2.80, or before 2.80, we had the render mode taking over all the interaction. So if you go to cycles and put on rendered, you, could, you couldn't do anything but to look at the scene. So Tom had this idea, why don't we have an overlay layer that contains all the interaction, which is composed, stacked on top of the, uh, what comes from the render engine. So this is like one of the early videos we had trying showing that already. So in this case, we always, I was able to move the object and cycles is still playing catch up. So you see like the little darkness behind the object for shape. And then you have the gizmos as a composed layer. In this case, it's not only as a one-liner, but then we also try to communicate these um, so-called diagrams and try to say, okay, how good, that how, how good that metaphor is, how easy it is for users to understand, for developers to understand. I've been informed that this design changed a little bit in the implementation level, so things are more intertwined, but we wanted to make sure that each mode had its own overlay layer, like the edit mode, the object mode, the pose mode, and to give us more freedom to develop them as well. Now, throughout design, there is uh, the big task of communication, right? Because you think about something, you're gonna have to iterate over that, you're gonna have to gather feedback from the team, you're gonna make sure the whole team is aligned and sharing the same concept. So a uh, approach I've been trying a lot recently is the, I call A4 design. It's effectively a full HD, because I almost never print those. And this is inspired by Toyota. Toyota has an A3, design approach where with one page of paper, you have all the information you need about a project and you can go and talk to everyone, gather all the kind of feedback, show to the stakeholders, the CS active levels. And of course you cannot tell a whole story in a single full screen piece of paper, but you can exercise the power of synthesis and see how clear the core of the concept is. Thus the one line, just like the one line expanded in four, um, I'll be using for not only feature design, but also anything you want to communicate. So trying to go from bird eye view to examples and, you know, try to communicate. These we used for the new data types when you wanted to have volume and hair data types in Blender. And even the simulation node, this, I don't know what we're gonna do once you get later into simulation, but this we're trying to find about a metaphor, about a CPU. Can we think about the logic and events and forces as this unit that be make it clear for people to understand? Now, so far I've been talking about big picture design, which is traditionally strategic design. It comes from oftentimes from Tony himself. He's so involved in a lot of those projects. But design is something that permeates everything we do. So it's actually it's also in the everyday work of the modules. So the modules have this big task, okay, animation 2025, how to define it, the future of animation, or for sculpting, how do we make sure people that are already using Blender for rendering can also use for sculpting, people that come from other sculpting tools. 
And there's a lot of work on fleshing those out and get to the specific feature set we need and try to nail down what are the user cases that can actually better serve uh, those projects. And, and this, while in the strategic level at Blender, we have this really tight structure where we have an institute in the studio. So Ton in his keynote was mentioning how we have 50 people in the payroll nowadays, from Dev Grant to people on the staff. A lot of these are the studio artists, which are a core part of the development team. They help us with the, well, use cases and testing the features. So for example, the whole hair project we had last year was possible also thanks to bringing people over. So Hans, which works for America, flew over. And then we could work throughout two months together with the production of Charge on how they make a scrubby male character with that whole new feature set for hair uh, sculpting. And again, the use cases in that case, okay. It's very, what are the use cases? How do you flesh out to make sure everything you do is anchored on something that people need to do? However, as a Blender is a open source community driven project, we also have what we call stakeholders. So artists who get involved in the modules, uh, either we invite them or usually they come and say, hey, I really wanna help, how can I help? It's one question we get a lot, how can I help? I have a lot of ideas. Ideas are great. Your professional ex expertise is really something very valuable. So for instance, we did all the hair development also on top of what uh, Daniel Bysted did. And Daniel, by the way, is giving a talk now at one o'clock. So it could be there. Maybe I can speak fast. <laughs> and what does a design look like at that level? Well, we have the uh, wireframes of, okay, you have a use case, how do you flesh that out? So for geometry nodes, you want to do basic scattering. Okay, which kind of functionality we need, what kind of building blocks we're gonna need for this feature. And more recently, we are doing, for instance, panels for the nodes, right? We want to be able to organize the principal shader, we want to be able to organize all the node groups people are doing to share their uh, creations and tools, whatnot. And this is more like a bit more operational, but you know, we just have to iterate and again, talk to people, show to people. Now, those are so-called wireframe mockups. There is still a moment where you do want to transition to pixel perfect mockups or high fidelity uh, mockups. It's always a tool, forgot that, it's a, you gotta find a balance on when to do that transition because the moment you go here, people are gonna be pointing to why is that color, that tint of gray. But I still with the digital tooling we have nowadays is a waste not to go there and you can definitely leverage. Uh, just be able to sh copy, create variations, to create iterations. Nowadays we use a lot of PenPot is an online open source vector uh, basic application. And it's, sorry. Besides basically mockups, we also still encourage like storytelling. Like what is the user journey when they're using a new tool? So this is for the upcoming brush asset system. So the draft system, like how do you expect people to experience? Can you, it is not even a wireframe, it's like a s oversimplified high level picture interaction map of the feature set. And again, these we can then communicate and like their concepts which are very abstract, like drafts. What does it mean to have a draft for a brush? Okay, how we can do it in a way that we can teach and then people can learn and teach again and understand and maybe the metaphor don't work and then we roll back, rinse and repeat. But it's also, it's funny because it, we do design decisions every day and it's one of those classic Mac that people say is like, if no one is a designer, someone is doing the design work. So to go find who that person is and make sure they have the design sensibility, they have design training because everything we do, we're gonna have to make a decision. So I might as well own that and make sure we can raise a flag when, okay, this is beyond what I think I could um, elaborate myself and beyond my capabilities. Let me try to find more people to help. This quick example was something we needed to create for the, uh, the warning system for when you open Blender with a file that has a mismatched version. What do you do? If you save that file, you're gonna have a uh, my lose data. You'll not be able to save it again. So quickly draw something on the whiteboard. And then I think this is a mock-up. I couldn't even remember, if I was showing this yesterday to someone like, is this a mock-up or the final result? Like, I don't remember because mock-ups got so good nowadays. I think it might be a mock-up, but the background is a, sc a screenshot. So saving time as much as possible. 
Now, we do have modules. This is how structured Blender development, right? So nodes, modeling, rendering. But we do also have like what, 30 million downloads, 20 million downloads. How do we make sure we leverage the community without getting overwhelmed? How do we make sure we still have a centralized, cohesive design view without being pulling into every direction and yet make sure pe people can participate in the process? This is like a, the holy grail, right? You don't want to do design by committee, but you don't want to alienate people that can give you like their own point of view uh, feedback. So we do have like a passive and active approach. Throughout all of these, it's always interesting when you see people like standing out based on their attitude. I would never mind clarifying a design topic for someone who can, you know, position themselves nicely. Say, I don't understand that. Can you explain why you went that route or not? But we also see a lot of people that are going to find a lot of friction if they already come from a position of feel alienated from the process or entitled, you name it. But basically, we do a lot of passive feedback, which is we just go to the jump to nodes hashtag, for example. What are people creating with the tools we made? Because you can talk the talk, you can say whatever, but if you talk the talk, walk the walk, it's different, right? We know where your feedback is coming from and it's more grounded and you can work together to find, okay, for this, this, this case, maybe a solution can contemplate all of them. One recent example was the repeat zone we have in geometry nodes. Because you saw people were just taking a node group and duplicating five times, six times, ten times when we introduced the simulation nodes because they needed the more sub steps. These require two different solutions. One is to have just a repeat zone, and the other one is to have simulation sub steps. This is still coming, I believe. But basically, developers do go to YouTube, to Twitter, to Mastodon, to whatever. They try to go where the conversation is. They don't go necessarily to user forums because it can be triggering for a lot of people because again, the attitude and the energy, at the end of the day, is a work, right? If you, during your work, you have to deal with toxicity, it won't make you happy. Uh, it doesn't make me happy, but this makes us very happy. Uh, the other approach, what I'm calling the active feedback, is sometimes for new features, we try to ask for very focused feedback. Hey, for simulation, for, hey, we're having our simulation nodes. This is what you can do already. Can you show, not your ideas and opinions on the vacuum, but can you show what you try to do with the feature? Tell us which workarounds you had to use and which showstoppers you might have had. And that's, that's all we need to work together to get your kind of feedback. So if you're, even if you're gonna post in your blog, in your video, if you can frame it like this, it's fantastic because then we know where your ideas come from we know okay, even the workarounds, which ones are problem, which ones are not. Maybe you don't even know other workarounds you could use. Um, so we did recently, not so, yeah. We even did, we go, sometimes we go as far as having a artist reaching out to us. Or in this case, I ask, actually ask Aaron Dale, say, hey, Aaron Dale, can you try to reproduce this? I saw a tutorial from probably, I guess with any, go figure. Say, hey, can you try to do this bridge effect or this castle with those gates and some ivy? He couldn't do the ivy. One of his feedback was like, hey, I need a for loop <laughs> or for each. So maybe you need to re revisit that attempt. But this is also a very interesting approach. Hey, you try to do something and you can share your frustrations, but also what you manage to do. Again, your workarounds and your showstoppers. So unvaluable. Hmm, we actually might be able to free you for the Daniel <coughs> hair talk. This is the last topic I wanted to bring because this is a very condensed talk and I'm going to open for questions, of course. But so far, I've been talking about almost an idealized work. Okay, we have this one big picture and everything worked great. Um, <laughs> these are the tools you try to use and we communicate and people like, yeah, they all shake heads and it's fantastic. It's not, so this is more a cautionary tale of something that's happening right now. So for Grease Pencil, or Grease Pencil 3.0, we wanted to integrate uh, Grease Pencil with Geometry Nodes. And for that, we say, okay, within the Geometry Nodes, what if we could try this one-liner that Grease Pencils are just curves, as far as the user is concerned. 
oh, if you want to have a specific layer or care about specific performance, maybe you should need to know how to do more. But it's one of those, like, try to do simple things simple and complex things possible. It's a cliche, but it's a pretty good cliche. Um, okay, so Grease pencils are just curves for geometry nodes. Okay, first, that means we exposed then Grease pencil as a new component on the spreadsheet and on the separate component node. Okay. Then we have a layer as a new domain, so we can, you know, evaluate. I'm getting too much into jump to nodes. Sorry about that. Don't need to follow along that closely. But then we have to, you can treat the layer a domain just as we treat spline, splines, and points. <coughs> and then we went over then all the curve specific nodes and converted them to also support grease pencil. So instead of having like one big node called grease pencil to curves. No, no, any curve node that people are already used to how it works should just be converted to it. We did this in the past two weeks, it's been fun. Um, but then that's interesting. When you start developing something, you're like, oh, damn, we didn't thought about that, or that has too many implications. So in our case, is how do we handle the layers in the case where we are not outputting curves anymore? For example, the curve to point node. Do you want to flatten and all the layers in one single point cloud? Or do you want to keep the point cloud of each layer still grouped as an instance, right? Um, it's not an easy answer. Like for us so far, we are, what we have now in the daily version of Blender is a version where we have the different groups with instances. But then, and that's super interesting because it's super fast. So, hey, performance. But then for users, that means, oh, if my group, which I don't know, the black box concept again. If this is a black box, I don't know what's happening. I usually put a curve and get a point out of this. Why if I put a grease pencil, now I'm getting an instance? What the heck is an instance? So it has some uh, implications and trade-offs. So what we try to do is to make sure we don't make those big one-liners lightly and we make sure like we try to do what's called reality, ch reality check a little bit, try to say, okay, can I have everyone on board of that? Is it clear to everyone? Because again, design is not something that should be delegated only to a design team that's not talking, but it's something that everyone in the team should be, you know, should be respectful and sensitive to it and try to work together on that. Um, I talked a bit more about some of those topics in a presentation I had at Penpot. If you're interested, go check it out. And I think we're done with the talk and then open for questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we have six minutes if you want to go to Daniel, Daniel's talk. But does anyone have a question? I have here, I have the whole day. Okay. Um, Tile, I mean, will be the node in Geometry Nodes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I'm not, but carry on. So, uh, I was assuming that you edit the whole panel for showing data that you are operating with in Geometry Nodes. Mm -hmm. But still, sometimes I find myself that I'm not really sure which particular data comes out of this or this part or this group or so there. Do you think about any um, other sort of you know, showing the data in, throughout the we, so the question was about co-inspecting tools and how can we analyze the specific data coming out, out of a node? Yeah. How do you treat debugging as a legit use case as well in the case of Geom to nodes So we first started with the spreadsheet editor as a tool which usually you don't need. That's interesting. Like, okay, we usually we're making tools for artists to use the tools. But sometimes you need to make a tool for when things don't work. It's a very interesting challenge. So we did we do this in uh, two ways. One is having the, just a spreadsheet editor, which is also an educational tool for people to even understand what is inside my object. Oh, those are this is my mesh. Um, you also have the concept of the viewer node, where we make sure, and again, those things are easy to say and hard to implement, because we make sure you can at any point stop your node tree and say, okay, what is being evaluated at that point, and show me on the on the spreadsheet. We didn't go far beyond that. Um, we know there are a lot of needs for debugging tools 
especially you want to bring the debugging for the viewport, um, like with gizmos. But I mean, in the, within the context of the design topic, I think is a is an is a case where it's interesting to look at this as a use case for the techno artists or debuggers. And so I think it's an interesting challenge, but we're open to understand what is missing on the existing tool set. So come talking to the, oh, sure, to me, but to, to Jack or to Hans. Overall, people with the green pin, they are developers. It, they can be praised and harassed with feature requests. Speaking of people that need a, a blue pin, it's for you. How for you? Howard is do, oh the gift another developer. Howard helps the whole boolean for developer with commit access with. <laughs> but carry on. Okay. Um, I think that the, uh, you know, we're, we're left sort of intuitive to make to, to find the UI that we see. And um, I'm wondering if there's a better way to document the design that we see. Okay, so the question, uh, the, I mean, I'm repeating because of the microphone doesn't catch people speaking. Um, so it's, I think basically we're saying that it's nice to have a big concept and whatnot, but how much of that gets to the final users, right? Um, it's a fair question because in, in theory, you don't even need. In theory, if the design is cohesive, the users would just feel that things work. It's a classic thing in Blender where you can just press G anywhere and you can just move your node or your object in the viewport. And things, so we have this cohesive uh, abstraction that works everywhere. So it's, it's like the spreadsheet editor. You shouldn't have to explain a design for people for it to click. Um, but we do try that in two ways. In a way, like the user manual is something that people downplay its importance. But the user manual is not for the final users necessarily. It's also for educators, content creators, because those are people that are gonna replicate what is the message, how we should be using that. So what we do also is make sure we are communicating. Again, communication, communication. So I do write a lot of in the blog posts in the code.blender.org. And I think we should do more work on that. So every one of those images I had in, uh, this is on the wiki page, but all those examples here, they are fleshed out in the, basically in the code uh, blog. And I don't know what else it could be doing, but I guess it could be hammering more and more like those concepts. For me, it's a bit less of the concept and more about trying to encourage developers to think about those one-liners for themselves as well and for their, or their projects and see how far you can carry that metaphor. So for example, before we had fields with geometry nodes, uh, we, were, we, could, we had a different approach, right? And then we, we were trying to have an approach where everything we have is a data flow. So every node just get data in and the data out. And we tried to see, okay, how far we can push that. And we had a few more caps on that. So this is what I call, I forgot the name I used, but basically have like two explore, explorative designs. So what are the implications with the use cases to have to pass every single attribute you want to be propagated to every single node? It gets a little bit annoying at some point because you might want to retrieve a selection that you created in the beginning of your node tree in the end. So Jack came up with the concept of the fields. And then, okay, it's a very, very hard concept to understand. But then how do we uh, indicate to users that something different is happening? Okay, we have the dashed line, we have a different socket. And there's we, something we never achieved um, is that we have ways sometimes to, illust to illustrate a concept, but for, it's like sometimes it's very abstract. But there's a difference between illustrate a concept and to visualize what that means. Or maybe it's the other way around, but one of the things to show like for the simulation zone, it's clear that we have a different color is a zone, something interesting is happening there. The way we visualize not, not necessarily help users to understand what is happening there. So there's a lot to be improved in, in that phase of the design as well. But first and foremost, you try to make sure that different concepts are shown differently. 
And if you have one concept defined in Blender, like layer, so the grid pencil layer, we've been having this debate like yesterday, like is layer just grouping? No, no, come on, we're gonna have in the future layered texture. So layer is something specific for grid pencil now because it's about composition, not about grouping, about compositing and the order of drawing. Okay, so let's not, if you want grouping for mesh, then that's a different concept. Let's try to have then a different concept. So. More questions? Curiosity? Oh. Uh, so I think Blender still feels uh, pretty angry, but sometimes uh, uh, I'm trying to do something that explores some uh, uh, data of the, the, the engine, uh, uh, something like uh, uh, CSV style. Like what, what format? CSV. CSV, okay. CSV, yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, as a, so the question is about specifically about how could I export for a file like a CSV file or yeah. we have something that works within Blender but then you want it outside of Blender in a different format. Yeah. Um, I'll try to reframe it for the context of design and what you're talking here. It's a pretty good question though. So short is we don't have an option but we thought about that. But for us it's also about the maybe the use cases and I mean, we do plan to have importing and exporting of uh, S SCV, S CSV files, but one of the challenges of design that we try to do is, you know, design, the naive design we believe is just trying to make everyone happy and let's make design for everyone. And that, we don't believe that much on that. Or I don't believe that much on that. So we get to pick a specific audience and use case. So we, know, we being focusing so, uh, so far into the animation pipelines. That's why we see use cases which are grounded on the, what you need for short film. And we're hearing more and more feedback from the scientific, I, I guess, scientific community, the game industry, like, hey, we'll also like to do procedural more modeling or not. The other, we hear a lot of, hey, I want to do in setting. I want to do a lot of modeling operations. Like, we know it's in the roadmap, but we haven't been prioritizing that. So in this context, it's more like we haven't been prioritizing those features yet because we have been trying to first make sure we have one audience that is well supported and then we can use that to basically to, to check what are the features that, to, that the design is valid and eventually can expand further. Um, it is one of the things that would easily, I mean, you can probably do that in Python already, by the way, it should, it should be very straightforward. Yeah, yeah. For me, I'll then say it's one of those cases where it would be really nice if you feel invited to go to the dev talk uh, forum and say, hey, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm trying to do. This is the current workaround. Yeah, using Python and whatnot. Those are the problems of this workaround and the show, showstoppers. Pretty good example of that. A dev, uh, dev talk. Dev as in development. Dev talk. Blender.org. So it's a pretty good question because it, there's two more hands and I think we, I have no idea about time, but I guess, I is, is there a talk here at one o'clock? I hope not, right? Okay, so we can have those questions. Mm -hmm. The spider meters outside of the node tree. Oh, the color map. It's a good question. So the question is about whether we could have color, well, the color map, color space control within a specific shader. No.
Okay. Um, okay, I, I got a question. So basically, we have a few specific nodes that have a very specific interface. Like you can do a curve slide, you can hold a color ramp, color map, and then those things work well as individual nodes, but we don't have a way to wrap it then to a higher level node group. That uh, uh, we have the same problem in geometry nodes where you cannot expose this for the modifier. Um, this is a, again a very interesting question because one of the ideas for geometry nodes, as I mentioned, is to be able to just be a modifier. Where is the modifier? And if you know the modifiers in Blender, you know that some modifiers they have in their interface a uh, curve profile or uh, so we, ha we have different inputs than what are available if you just expose something. So we have a list of those, like recently we implemented for 4.0, the anum socket, oh no, it's 4.1, sorry. For 4.1 we have anum socket, which is this drop down where you can pick different options. And as far as design is concerned, we, we do have this idea that anything you do, in any node in Blender could have been a node group built with building blocks. So we still have a way to go there. So the color ramp is a good example. The, those menu switch is another example. The idea, the sub panel I showed one of the slides is another example of that because the modifiers, they can have nice sub panels. So mm, if I'm creating my own modifier with the, my custom tools, I should be able to also get that. Was took like I think more than two months to implement. It's not so straightforward. But the idea is that we want to be able to do everything you can do within a node, you should be able to do it as, as a node group. And more and more you can have users dealing with middle level node groups or modifiers. And more, people more tech savvy will then work with the building blocks and the components. But it's a pretty good question. So there was a one, a call last question here. Yep. So the question is, in between the design process and I guess not so much in the big picture, but when you try to flesh it out and how do we deliver it to that idea, how much do you handle reference from other software, other projects? So the first thing to that is that we have a, we intend to be in between, let's say Houdini and cinema in terms of complexity. So again, it comes with this idea, let's have one clear, try to have this very clear from the beginning. So any decision we make is informed by that. So we see that for instance, Houdini is a more technical audience in a way. You have to use nodes, you have no option. Cinema, I think Cinema now has some node based thing, but Cinema is, it was known for be um, a more graph ha uh, heaven. You know, we can do everything with the duplicators and whatever clones without having to do a single node connection or whatnot. Super powerful, super powerful. But we try to have this initial target audience that is different than those software. So even if you could want to just take those experiences one and one and put into Blender, it's very different, right? Um, of course, in Blender, we want to make sure that the tech savvy people can also you know, have a good time. That's why we have this concept of, okay, for the average user, maybe you just have a modifier that you, someone, your TD or someone on the internet prepared for you and you can work on that. For the TD people, we have the building blocks and maybe even some medial level, like a random, ro random rotation node group. For 4.1, I shouldn't say that online because then uh, it becomes binding, but <laughs> I want to do a node group for scattering. It's always tricky because uh, it won't be able to handle every single situation, but we probably don't need to handle every single situation. Just want the incisor, the geometry, the transformation, the random rotation option. So I do have a prototype for that already in my computer. Um, because again, we want to make sure different audiences can uh, interface with different parts of the software. Um, besides that, there's a question about 
I don't say how we handle with reference, but usually how can user share their experience coming from a different software and present that as a problem with the Blender feature set. So flipping this around a little bit, you as a, I guess, Houdini artist, or how can you like say, oh, I miss that feature so much in Maya, in Houdini, in SketchUp, how can I uh, make the developers aware of that? What we recommend people is to focus a bit less in the feature and more about on what you're trying to do and what is that the tool gives you. Or another way of framing that is if you had that tool, what you'll be able to do this in this best case scenario. And we can try to think together what would be the Blender way of doing that, which, what is the way that would click because people are used to those principles every else in Blender. Yeah. Um, we, I mean, I have more time, but I don't know if if you have more questions, then, yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty good question, like, uh, by the way, pretty good questions, plural. So how do we handle a, let's say, if you see an add-on, an extension of Blender that's doing something which would be adding value to everyone, do we consider implementing that in Blender, bring that add-on itself into Blender, we either don't do anything because people can already, you know, go there and, and handle that? Um, were you before, were you here for the first the talk from Julian on yeah. on UX and add-on? Okay, because a is a, there's always there are a few angles to that that question. Uh, the first one is not add-ons would comply to the Blender high level of standards for the user interface and the interaction you would have. I've been mentioned a few times that we want a cohesive experience, and sometimes you see add-ons taking shortcuts and finding solutions for UI and UX which is all fine, but that is not something we can just plug plug and play, yeah, I guess. Plug and play into Blender and expect this to lead to a very nice experience to everyone. Um, part of a, one of the solutions we want to, we're pursuing for that is the extensions platform. Because, you know, production code is still valid code even though it's taking shortcuts, but if you have to maintain in Blender, it has more implications. But I guess with something like the extensions platform would allow more people to have a place to open, to share open and free extensions of Blender without having to fight a little bit with the core design of Blender. Now, there's a second angle to that question is, okay, most of the add-ons, well, they're, all the add-ons are GPL compliant, the ones which are shared and distributed. Some of them are self-contained, some of them are have ways to connect to the blue box and the black box Tom was showing his keynote, right? But I've, let's focus on the ones which are, let's say I'm an add-on developer, I have something that's fully GPL compliant, doesn't require any asset which is not Creative Common. Um, you could say that you could just take this add-on and put it into Blender, which legally is fine. Um, it's not, necessarily the best course of action because you're also alienating a, uh, you know, a contributor from the project from sometimes even the livelihood <laughs> they have, but even the one way they know how to contribute is doing their own solution. So we know that a lot of good design and designers got channeled into the add-on uh, space, not even say marketplace, but just the space that people can explore more ideas more easily there. So one of our challenges is not so much trying to find the feature set which are, we're lacking, but who out there are getting a, pretty much a pretty good UX designers, and UI designers, like who can actually have a knack for how we do things in Blender. And those people would like them to be welcome to contribute to the core of the project. So that's the best case scenario. You know, they feel like, you know what, yeah, I want to 
find a way to either help porting these into as a core feature or help maintaining more aligned to the Blender UI UX guidelines. So that's part of the one of the ideas we'd like to explore. Um, the final the final angle I'd go there is like how can we make sure a Blender out of the box is a complete experience? There's always gonna be things that are specific and niche that you're gonna be better served by out, outside plugins, right? Blender's supposed to be general and, and, and useful for a lot of people, but, um, but then how do you balance, okay? So we do are very aware that if something is not in the core, Blender shipped with Blender is something that Blender's lacking. So we don't treat it as, okay, it's an add-on, it's fine, people can just go there. So we do take that seriously. It's even, one thing Tom asked me to try to pursue recently was, hey, can you try to map out what are the core add-ons people cannot live without? And try to see why, and try to see whether we could maybe invite those developers to, maybe they already made enough you know, money from those add-ons, they can just be first contributors to the extensions platform. Like, why not? Is that, you know, we're all building something together to everyone. And I think there's a lot to be gained by closing that bridge and closing that gap. Um, ultimately, I also see add-ons uh, more, uh, more as a space for experimentation and exploration. And then, again, those things could be used as a start point for own projects, as a, even as a validation for, you know, okay, it's worth pursuing this pipeline. We did this in a way for, well, even for core features. Like you think about Eevee, Eevee is started as a project by Clement on his own time doing a PBR renderer. Like, okay, that showed that people are excited about it. It validates already the product. So let's now design it, this the core. We have this also for sculpting tools that Pablo Dobara was developing. He was developing on his own time, we brought it back. So it's not different, for, uh, the, for add-on is not so different than those forks and experiments. The tricky part is when people are already making a living of these and I think it's interesting for, is what I mentioned about the attitude. Um, Blender is you know, providing a living for a lot of people. And it's interesting for people that want to contribute to the project to feel welcome, then I think that's one of the ways. I don't know if I answered, because this is a, not a, a simple question. No. So that wasn't a, a simple answer. I think I will, you can, I'm gonna wrap it now. I'm gonna be here every day, all days. And thanks so much again for your time and your questions.